Thank you. Thank you for the invitation to be with you again to crack open the word, this time in light of Synod. It is an honor to be with you. This series on Synod and the Sunday Gospels has sparked many meaningful conversations. The narrative of the woman caught in adultery or the woman accused of adultery probably would not have been my first choice if I were selecting a gospel that would help us reflect on synod. Yet, it offers much for our reflection on how we do synod together and address power and sexuality in our conversations within our church. As we are well aware at this point, we have been called to a synod on synods. We gather in order to discuss how we talk with one another. What is the quality of our relationships within the church? How do we organize ourselves? How do we make decisions? How do we listen to one another? When do we experience affirmation and support? And when do we encounter dismissal, manipulation, or exploitation? Basic surface level synod lessons from this gospel reading might include, don't come ready to hurl accusations or stones. We're all capable of being hypocrites, tread carefully. And be like Jesus and create space for others. These surface level lessons are worthwhile but can be easily misused to compound the harm many have experienced within the church. Power dynamics must be taken into account. The early church seems to have recognized that these basic lessons were both particularly essential for church leaders, as this story is featured in both the Didascalia and the Apostolic Constitutions, from the early third century. And these documents are particularly addressed to bishops, which is noted in Mary, Col uh, Mary Colo's commentary on John 1 through 10 in the Wisdom Commentary series. Thus, these messages of coming ready and not hurling th stones, of remembering that we're all capable of being hypocrites, and to be like Jesus and create space for others are especially for those who are in positions to abuse their power, not those who experience the abuse or misuse of power. So let us dig a little deeper into this reading. This gospel begins by telling us people were gathered in order to hear Jesus teach. They have come ready to listen. Perhaps they asked questions. Maybe they soaked in every word Jesus spoke. They might have been fascinated and wondered at Jesus's teaching. Openness, a willingness to listen, and desire to really hear the other person are key aspects of the synod process we've been asked to engage in. Yet when the scribes and Pharisees enter the scene, their accusations and agenda do not encourage genuine listening or dialogue. Instead, their words are designed to trap Jesus. The entire worldwide church is asked to participate in this synod process in order to listen and dialogue with each other, perhaps not unlike those who gathered to listen to Jesus. Diocese after diocese prepares processes in which people listen for the Spirit's guidance through the wisdom of the people of God. Dioceses find creative ways of inviting everyone to enter into the process. Teams of people go about the very serious work of compiling the responses. However, as we know, not every diocese and every bishop has approached the call to synod with a genuine interest in hearing from the whole people of God. Some simply go through the motions. Some are uninterested in entertaining a conversation about how we talk to one another. Sometimes voices are excluded 
or stifled in their local churches. I spoke to the man appointed to lead the synod process in one diocese, and he admitted that he intentionally crafted a process that would dissuade people from bringing up irrelevant subjects that weren't going to change anyway. His examples of issues that weren't going to change included the church's teaching on LGBTQ plus persons, contraception, divorce, wisdom's ordination or women's ordination. Suspiciously, seemingly all issues that pertain to gender and sexuality. It was clear to me that this man charged with leading the Senate in the diocese was not ready to genuinely listen. He did not approach synod with openness and he did not welcome the voices of all God's people who needed to be heard. The synod process in that one diocese at least was limited and stifled. I suspect he was governed more by fear than malicious intent. Does it matter though? Either way, he made himself into a tool that would uphold a broken patriarchal system. He was willing to flex his power through a local synod process that perpetuates harm and silences inconvenient voices that deserve to be heard, need to be heard, and are intended to be heard. He was attempting to do his job faithfully. The scribes and the Pharisees also attempted to live faithfully. And they decided that attempting to trap Jesus was the way forward. However, in this gospel, even when a genuine desire to listen and understand is lacking, there is still room for something significant to occur. The scribes and Pharisees initiated the attempted murder of an unnamed woman, but that's not what happened. Jesus created space, responded with nonviolence, bent over instead of adopting a challenging, escalating posture. Jesus created space for something different to happen, despite the intentions of the leaders. They were able to find either the wisdom or the guilt to stop their persecution of the woman and walk away. I trust that this messy, unwieldy, worldwide synod will be effective in ways we cannot yet know. The act of engaging the entire church and beyond, as well as soliciting people's widespread participation cannot be undone, even if people have to circumvent their local synod processes in order to participate, and we do. Pope Francis has made space for something new to happen and we enter into it wholeheartedly. Now let us turn to the experience of the woman in the story. While the woman captures our attention, this is not truly her story. This is a story about Jesus. More specifically, it is a story about Jesus once again, successfully dodging the attempts of the religious leaders, the scribes and Pharisees, to trap him. The woman is a pawn or a prop in this narrative. Biblical scholar Jenna Hintz Piazza has focused her scholarship in part on minor characters in scripture. The woman in this gospel is unnamed nearly voiceless, and at the edges of a story not her own. She certainly qualifies as a minor character. Hins Piazza cautions that we must pay attention to the concerns of minor characters, because if we read past them and ignore them in the biblical text, we are also at risk of reading past them and ignoring them in real life. I suspect 
that those of us gathered here don't need hence Piazza's prompting in order to consider the perspective of this woman. I suspect that many of our experiences of church lead us to identify far too clearly with the woman. We know very little about this woman. We don't know if she's wealthy or poor. We don't know if she's married or betrothed, for she must be one of the other in order to commit adultery. We don't know who she was caught with, whether it was someone well known in the community or even someone present in the crowd. We don't know why the man involved goes unmentioned and faces no consequences, though we certainly want to cry out over the injustice. We don't know whether or not her participation in adultery was consensual. Since this is a story about attempting to entrap Jesus, we do not even know whether or not the charge against her was fair and just. Interestingly enough, the oldest manuscripts do not include Jesus's parting words and sin no more. So it is truly unclear as to whether or not she was guilty of the sin of which she is accused. The laws in Torah stipulate that both people caught in adultery should be put to death in Leviticus. And the penalty or suggested method is stoning in Deuteronomy. The laws of Deuteronomy are all about property rights and the woman is viewed as the property of the father, husband, or brother. Yet the Roman empire did not allow stoning as a punishment for adultery. Again, according to the uh, wisdom commentary series on John. And we see in the passion narratives that the Jewish leaders are particular about not breaking the law by putting Jesus to death themselves. Yet high emotions and angry accusatory riled up crowd could stir up trouble and could be still very dangerous for both the woman and possibly for Jesus. What must this woman have thought as she saw that she was being used to test the teacher? Did she fear that Jesus would be one more teacher of the law ready to accuse her? Was she concerned that he might take the easy way out the easy way out may have been simply agreeing with the scribes and Pharisees. Was she too fearful to respond or attempt to defend herself because there was no way out of her predicament? Jesus's actions, again, of bending over, writing on the ground, seem like classic nonviolent actions. He de-escalates and as noted earlier, creates space he doesn't stare people down and challenge, meeting accusation with accusation. Instead, he bends over and gives people space to walk away. Evidently, both leaders and those in the crowd who are listening to his teaching have all walked away. But how did the woman experience these moments? Was she confused, overwhelmed? Did time slow down in suspense as she feared for her life. We know she was silent throughout the ordeal. She doesn't speak until she is alone with Jesus. And how many people have felt alone in a church that accuses them, stifles them, and all but pushes them out the door or sometimes succeeds in pushing them out the door? How many injustices have people experienced? In order to prepare for today, I found myself reflecting on what I have personally either witnessed or experienced. And the list was too long and included a seminary, 
a seminarian charged on two counts of indecency with a minor, reporting a priest for abusive behavior. Hearing the pain of a young man who was able, unable to come out to his family because he knew he would no longer have a family. And I trust that his assessment of the situation was accurate. A woman who was driven away for doing her job and uncovering corruption. Married couples told they can't receive communion because their previous marriages cannot be annulled. A college student of mine in tears when Pope Francis, who earlier told reporters, who am I to judge in response to a question about our LGBTQ plus siblings in Christ, now said that marriages between same-sex persons couldn't be blessed or recognized as sacraments. Little girls told they are not allowed to be altar servers. Catholic politicians running for president who attend Sunday liturgy at mother houses of women religious so they don't have to fear the Eucharist being used as a weapon against them due to their positions on abortion. Women studying in theological graduate programs who were not sure they could remain Catholic by the time they completed their degrees because there's no room for them to live out their calls in this church. Again, these are all stories I have either personally witnessed or experienced. And I am just one person. There are so many other stories gathered here today. This gospel has one last lesson for us. And I think it is an intriguing and important and unexpected one. The textual history of this gospel is interesting and may speak to us of what we need from Synod. This story of the woman accused of adultery is not original to the gospel of John. Yes, it originally was not in the Gospel of John. The oldest manuscripts we have do not include it. Furthermore, manuscripts that do include it place it in a variety of places. Three different places in John's Gospel, and it also shows up once in Luke. The vocabulary in this passage is more akin to the synoptic gospels. For example, the gospel of John nowhere else uses the phrase scribes and Pharisees in order to describe the Jewish leaders, which instead is a common phrase that we see in the synoptic gospels. This is unusual. This story is considered in spite of all of this, by many scholars to be a genuinely authoritative text, even if it is not original to John. As we noted earlier, it was used as a reminder to bishops not to abuse their power and to treat people gently. I mentioned this fascinating textual history of this story because I think it may serve as a metaphor for many in our church. Many people in our church feel out of place as though they don't quite fit. And this story has struggled to find its right place within the gospels. Even its positioning now reads as an interruption. If you read it, what, become, what comes before and after, you could easily lift this passage right out. Yet it was deemed authoritative, essential, and a clear part of the tradition that needed to be handed down. And so it has been. It has found its current home, no matter how much it's a little bit awkward. And the many people who don't quite fit comfortably within our church also have an authoritative message we need to hear. They are essential and a clear part of our church to be treasured and their wisdom handed down. 
Thank you very much.